It's been really great spending time with you over the last three weeks. What I enjoyed the most is being in conversation with so many of you. We talked two weeks ago about loving our city, loving our neighborhood, but more importantly, we talked about loving the people in our neighborhood. It's not about loving the buildings um, or the programs. It's about loving the people in our neighborhood. Throughout the week after that, I heard from a lot of you, um, we, I heard the, about the difficulties of what that actually means. So then last week, we talked about the assumptions that we hold about those people that keep us from loving them. Now, admittedly, last week was, was a little heavy, so I thought this week I would go a little lighter, and to that end, we'll start by talking about death. <laughs> So I have, I have this fascination, well, okay, it's, it's a little fascination with epitaphs and obituaries. It's not like I'm obsessed about them, but I, I do find it interesting. Um, I, what I find interesting is the last words that people choose to be immortalized by, these words that they choose to have written in stone or in the newspaper for, for all of eternity. These final thoughts or musings often point to people's allegiances and, and the roots of their identity. I did a little bit of internet research about some of the best epitaphs and obituaries, and I wanted to share some of these with you. There is, uh, of course, to start this one. Um, I don't know that anyone has actually ever done this, but it's the joke about requesting pallbearers from the Canucks so they can let you down one last time. How about that? Um, Comedian Spike Milligan asked to be buried in a washing machine because he wanted to confuse archaeologists of the future. His epitaph reads, I told you I was ill. A woman by the name of Emily Phillips wrote in her own obituary, um, she says, It pains me to admit it, but apparently I have passed away. Everyone told me it would happen one day, but that's simply not something I wanted to hear, much less experience. Once again, I didn't get things my way. That's been the story of my life, all my life. Um, This one, you have to wonder about the relationship between the mother and her children, because the opening line of her obituary says, Ding dong, the witch is dead, but the memory of our mother lives on. (laughs) The lesson here, I think, is to treat your kids who are going to write your obituary to treat them well. Um, Now, this last one uh, really got to me. One of uh, Katie's friends moved to San Francisco not that long ago, and she was going for a walk with her daughter when she came across a particular headstone. Uh, This is what Katie's friend wrote on Facebook. She said, I can't imagine how angry and unforgiving you would have to be to put this in writing on stone for forever. So here's a headstone. This man's name is John Vincent Kearney. And his headstone says, loved by his family and friends, betrayed by Jane and Jerry. (laughs) I hope Jerry wasn't our music director, Jerry. (laughs) What I love about these is that they point to our lives and the way we choose to live them. And so this morning, I want to look at these uh, allegiances that we have and where our identity is rooted. But before we do that, um, let's just take a moment to pray. God, you are so good. Continue to fill this place with your Holy Spirit. God, continue to encourage us in ways we need to be encouraged continue to challenge us in ways we need to be challenged. Um, God, may you, may you continue to be in this time and in this place. We pray this in Jesus' awesome and holy name. Amen. Our lectionary reading for this week is not an easy one. It starts with, if you want to follow me, you have to hate your father and your mother. To me, that's like the the, the perfect Mother's Day card. (laughs) Um, But even in these difficult or um, these confusing passages, God continues to speak to us. As I was preparing for this sermon, I came in a lot of research that indicates that in Aramaic, 
um, the language Jesus spoke to those who followed him, the word hate uh, connotes less um, it connotes less the anger and hardship we often associate with that word these days. Uh, but for Jesus, that word may have meant love less than. Part of me is a little hesitant, uh, a little hesitant about this interpretation because I, I wonder whether it's an attempt to make a hard passage a little more palatable. But in this case, uh, Jesus would have been suggesting to the crowds gathered at his feet that we were not to overtly despise our family, but simply that we ought to love them less than God. Now, I like that because it's, it, it feels less controversial, and I feel like I might be able to do that. If Jesus were to say, I, I have to hate my father and my mother, that's a lot harder. And I don't know, I don't know that I could do that. Now, within its, its proper context, it's also important to remember that when Jesus speaks these words, he's speaking to a large crowd. The passage starts with Jesus was followed by large crowds. Now, at this point in his ministry, he's become somewhat of a celebrity, right? In the religious climate of his time, he would have been at worst a B-list celebrity, maybe, an, maybe even an A-list celebrity. Um, he's, so he's, he's attracting all sorts of people who are curious about the healings they heard about. They're, they're curious about his revolutionary teachings that point to a whole new way of being human in community with each other and in communion with God. Now Jesus looks at them, looks at these crowds, and he says, there's a cost to discipleship. This isn't just some show where you come and listen to some nice words that make you feel good about yourself, crafted together with well-placed pronouns, and then you just go home unchanged. And Jesus says there is a cost to this. Now here's an example of this. Sometimes leading worship makes it hard for those in leadership to, for, them, for them to worship. Five years ago or so, I was longing for a space and a time where I, I could sit in God's presence and worship without having to worry about whether the technology would come through, whether the person reading scripture had the right passage or was even here. So I found a local church with some friends that offered a Saturday evening service. It was really great. Um, it, was a, it was an incredibly profound experience. Uh, but I, I ended up only going once and my my friends and I only decided to go once because what became evident is that um, this just wouldn't work with our understanding of church. A church is not simply about going to a building. It's not a consumer product. It's, it's about committing to doing life with a group of other believers who are committed to the same vision and mission. And West Vancouver United Church is where I am called to do that, not this other church. To attend that other service with my understanding of church would have been really difficult and it would have required for me to get to know the men and women and children gathered under that roof, something I simply don't have space for in my life. Because community is not easy and it requires an investment of time. And I, I just, I couldn't imagine committing to two separate communities. So we stopped going. Now I am so glad I stopped going because the very next Sunday, the sermon at that popular church was about involvement. And the pastor said, if you are only planning on taking from this community and not giving back, then find another home because that's not church. <laughs> like I said, I am really glad I had made up my mind before that. <laughs> but what, what's, what Jesus is doing in this passage is the exact same thing. This is Jesus' equivalent of saying, there's a cost to this. If you're just here for the fish and the bread, help yourself, but consider staying home after that. And Jesus then goes on to give two examples. The first is about someone who builds a tower. 
Jesus says, if you're going to build a tower, you need to evaluate whether you have everything you need to bring your project to completion. The second example he gives is about a king readying for battle, realizing he only has 10,000 troops facing an army of 20,000. Can I do this, or should I simply extend an offer of peace? So Jesus is here asking people, are you prepared for the journey of discipleship? As many of you have experienced in your own lives, the traffic on the North Shore is bad. Like, it's, it's so bad that it's almost cliche to complain about it. The only redeeming part of these long commutes for me is, um, is on the coast, the on the coast team from CBC. Uh, I, 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 I'm pretty sure my wife has a secret crush on Stephen Quinn. Um, <laughs> one afternoon, Lisa Christensen, uh, Lisa Christensen, who I think is hilarious, uh, gave the, the following traffic report. She said, Mary called in to say there was a blue vehicle stalled on the ironworkers bridge. Mary would also like to say that she is the woman sitting in that blue car and that you can all stop giving her the finger now. She feels bad enough. (laughs) This is what Jesus is getting at. He's saying in this passage, if you want to follow me, make sure you're prepared for the road ahead because the last thing you want to do is stall out on the ironworkers bridge, lest you be ready to have crowds of people give you the finger. So what does this mean for us as 21st century Christians striving to live out Jesus' way in our communities on this North Shore and beyond? Well, two things. The first pertains to our allegiances. What Jesus is saying is that he wants all of you. And Jesus wants all of me. He doesn't just want our Sunday best. He wants our Monday blues. I don't really know what expression goes with Tuesday, but he wants your Tuesday too and your Wednesday. He wants your sleeping. He wants your working. He wants your playing and your laughing. And here's the thing, Jesus also wants your crying. He wants your manipulating. He wants your gossiping. He wants all of you because it's all of you that God is interested in redeeming and sanctifying and bringing along on this journey of holiness. God's not interested in the you that you're able to manicure and create. God is profoundly interested in the real you and in all of you. Plus, who would we be fooling anyway? If Jesus wants all of us, what does that mean for our identity? Well, here's a question. What is your identity? How do you see yourself? Are you a lawyer who happens to be a Christian? Or are you someone striving to follow Jesus whose life through a series of events has enabled you to practice law, to bring justice in this world? Are you a retiree who is a Christian? Are you a retiree who comes to West Vancouver United Church on Sunday mornings? Or are you a follower of Christ with all of who you are, who happens to have been placed at Kiwanis or at the Westerly? Now, the way you answer this question has profound repercussions for the way you embody your faith. Are you a stay-at-home mom or a musician, or a stay-at-home dad, or are you a follower of Christ that wants nothing more than to see this world be a little bit more like God's kingdom? I started this morning talking about obituaries and epitaphs. I, I, I certainly hope that when all of, all of this, when all of this is over, 
I certainly hope that the people I'm surrounded by don't start my obituary with Ding Dong, the witch is dead. And if they do, I apologize if that's how they feel about me. <laughs> Instead, though, I would hope that I would every single day give all of who I am to God. What about you? As you go about your daily living and your daily loving, I encourage you to take time this week to look at the parts of you that you've surrendered to God, but also at the parts that you hold on to. Are you willing to let go of them? Are you willing to flip around your identity so you're not simply a worker or a student following Jesus, but that you are first and foremost a disciple? What might that look like? And who might help you and I get there? As this passage teaches us this morning, Jesus invites us to flip our allegiances, to flip our identity, to say, God, you get my life first, and I need your help getting there.